goldenjackass.com. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure being on, and uh, as usual, lots happening. We're, I think, Elijah, I, I actually think we're out of the eighth inning here, and we're in the ninth inning. This is this is the this is a resolution time. This is a period where we're going to have solutions put on the table. This is where we're going to see things actually break and force a solution. Uh, we're, we're pretty much done with the phony solutions and patches, although they might continue to try more. They're not going to really get much uh, power and effect out of them. But we're in the ninth inning now. This, this is the end of the end game. Now, I'd like to discuss about this today and how, you know, you've made a lot of forecasts in the past, and it seems like a lot of them are playing out right now. Did you want to discuss a little bit about these forecasts? And I guess we can start with that NATO is fracturing right now. Yes, it's it's getting very messy with respect to NATO. Um, on, on the one hand, you have you have the British and the French participating in uh, – attacks in Syria and knocking out Russian and Syrian installations and killing their their military personnel. But there are other examples where Germany, France, and England have all been working side by side with Russia to knock out, say, uh, pirate oil convoys from ISIS. So there have been many examples in the past where some some NATO members like, as I mentioned, Germany, France, and Britain have been working very closely with Russia in in their campaign in Syria. Um, you also have the, the big event, which is the United States, although they lie and say they weren't participant in this, they attempted to do a coup d'etat uh, against Erdogan in Turkey. And there have been some very deep, far-reaching consequences for this. And it looks to me like we're, we're seeing – I hate calling it progress. How about just steps are being made uh, whereby Russia is going to share perhaps the Incirlik Air Force Base in Turkey with the Turkish military. There's more – what I'm trying to say is there's – tighter relations, more cooperation going on between the Turkish military and the Russian military than ever before, and Russia's making some requests to have landing rights and you know temporary usage of the Air Force Base, the gigantic Air Force Base spanning many square miles. It's a NATO Air Force Base in Turkey, and it looks like it's off-limits. Evidence of off-limits is that a month ago, the U.S. military removed all the nuclear weapons and moved them to Bulgaria and Germany from Turkey. Okay, Elijah, I think the NATO is starting to fracture. And before I I get off this topic, there's a, a critical error that I think the U.S. government made with respect to NATO. After the Ukraine war began in February of 2014, the U.S. actually told the presidents and prime ministers of the member nations of the EU, who are also members of NATO, that since the continent is in a state of war, that their presidents will take orders, their leaders will take orders from the NATO supreme commander. We, the U.S. overstepped its power reach. I mean, already the French and German and Italian leaders are taking orders from Brussels, the EU fascist dictatorship. They call it the commission. It's not. It's a, it, yeah, it's a commission, but it's a commission of fascist dictators. Okay, there's no election. There's just all orders, and you see evidence in the fact that they just extended the Russian sanctions from the EU even though – Almost no member state wanted to continue with them. All right, so the U.S. had the leaders take orders from the NATO Supreme Commander, and all the nations objected. So this is a bit of a blowback uh, with a climax of the the failed Turkish coup d'etat. 
we're going to lose, the U.S. is going to lose Turkey in NATO, and I think afterwards that splinter is going to cause some cracks in NATO and its fracture. So, Eli, that's the forecast, fracture. Now, I was thinking if we can move forward here a bit, one of the ones that I thought was really relevant to what you just said was one of the forecasts that you have is that Russia and China are totally capturing Greece and Turkey. Did you want to talk about this? Yes, there, there have been some events way before the failed U.S. coup d'etat in Turkey. Um, to begin with, Greece has been pretty much ravaged. Uh, they were forced to do austerity budgets, so there are a lot of layoffs and a lot of government support for various industries and welfare and you know you name it, Greece suffered it. But in order to make the payments to the German banks, a lot of prized assets in Greece were sold off and captured uh, as, as collateral, you know, default captured collateral seized by the German banks. So Greece is very resentful and, and, and full of ravaged assets. Then came Turkey. Turkey shot down last November a, a Russian Su fighter aircraft in the military. And a lot of consequences after that. Their tourism went to went to the toilet. Uh, a lot of things went bad. Their their exports of food industry uh, it it went sour, and their economy suffered pretty much about a 20% decline, a 20% recession. That, that's just horrendous. Okay, well now Russia's coming in and and they're starting up the Turkish Stream gas pipeline with Gazprom, and they're renewing their their giant uh, Rosatom uh, nuclear facility in Turkey, and they're re-energizing again their huge natural gas storage facility project, and numerous others. <clears throat> At the same time, Ch China came in and bought one of the largest Greek shipping ports called Piraeus. Okay, we're, we're having lots of evidence that, that Greece and Turkey are targeted by Russia and China for economic capture. And at the same time, don't expect any more problems for the Russian ships to move through the Bosporus Straits, which are technically Turkey, but right on the edge of Greece as well. I think Russia and China, Elijah, are going to capture Greece and Turkey and control the entire eastern corner of the Mediterranean. So when the U.S. tried to cut off the Crimean naval port facility for the Russian Navy, two years and a half later, here we are, and it's all gone wrong. Moving on here, I'd like to discuss now about how you've you've forecasted that the EU Commission was going to be ignored and irrelevant, and we're seeing that playing out right now, you say. Can you talk about this? Yes, this is a very touchy subject because we're talking about a fascist dictatorship uh, office. This is their helm. This is where you've had quotes recently, well, a few months ago from an economics advisor who says, well, this is what we want, the, the trade union, and we don't answer to the people, we answer to the commission. In other words, this is a dictatorship and we're part of it. This economic office is part of it. Okay, there, there, there are two things that convince me the EU Commission is going to be ignored. The, the first is the Russian sanctions. Now, as a, a little quick preface, we, we always have the annual Davos Economic Forum. That's what they call it, the Davos Economic Forum in Switzerland. I contend that it is a central banker and elite banker barbecue with martinis and whiskey with no CEOs there at all, with no industrial captains at all at what they call an economic summit. It's a central bank barbecue and open bar. Okay, a few months ago, I think it was June, we had the St. Petersburg Economic Forum hosted by Russia. It just happened to be that very few bankers were there, but about a hundred CEOs were there. 
And I contend that that indeed was an economic forum, whereas Davos was a central bank barbecue and open bar. So at the, the St. Pete Economic Forum, they signed about 50 deals worth $23 billion among, with Russia among the EU member states. Every one of the deals was in violation of the EU anti-Russian sanctions. Every single one of them. So that is defiance. Okay. Now, that's on the economic side. On the other side, you have the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. That's between the United States and the European Union. They call it the Trade Union. It's the Obama baby. It is a dastardly, bold, fascist dictatorship power grab. They want to block all labeling of GMO foods, you know, all the chromosome altering garbage that they put into food systems. Uh, they want to uh, continue with the, the shared uh, intellectual property across Europe and the United States. They want to do a whole lot of other things in this trade union that are extremely ugly, like uh, have all resolution of conflict handled by boards appointed by the corporations and have the corporations secure a lot of intellectual property. So in other words, the businesses will take control, they will own the assets, and they will settle all disputes. No thank you. There's not a single European country that has signed on for Obama's TTIP fascist trade union and the American press and the American public have no freaking idea that it's a fascist power grab. They think, oh no, it'll improve trade, it'll, it'll bring about more commerce, it'll lift our economies that are in trouble, it'll do nothing of the sort. So not a single European country has signed on, Elijah. So those are your economic and political trade unions that are all failing and falling on their faces. These are the babies of the EU Commission. They're being ignored. Now, when it comes to, you know, we've talked about a lot before about a gold-backed currency and that you think China is going to launch a gold-backed currency. Now, one of your recent forecasts is that the, you know, the yuan, the short-term note, is going to be launched as being gold-backed, and this will kill the U.S. Treasury bill. And you're saying that we're seeing this play out right now. Uh, I don't know about the gold portion being played out right now, but we are starting to see a lot of trouble uh, with trade payments at ports and the, the standard – currency is the dollar and the vehicle is the U.S. Treasury bill. So they're called T-bills. Okay, the U.S. T-bills are having trouble. Now, notice that Han Jin, the South Korean shipping giant, went bankrupt, went into receivership, and had all kinds of problems with, it, it's hard to conceive of this, but several hundred ships uh, roaming the globe with difficulties to unload their cargo. And remember, if Han Jin delivers uh, to a port like in Los Angeles, a, a container vessel, and it has a thousand containers on it, Han Jin does not own the cargo. It, it, it's like a, a company does in China or a company does in Japan or Korea, and they're looking to deliver to say retail chains across the United States. Okay, the story we're told, and, and you know me, I don't believe most of the stories we're told when they come to economics and finance, and almost always I'm proven correct in my assumption that they're either half-truths or full of lies. It just takes time to draw out. Okay, so we're told that Han Jin can't deliver its cargo in Los Angeles, Oakland, Tacoma, and elsewhere. That's what we're told. I don't believe that's quite true. I believe we're having some severe problems 
uh, that are not, as we're told, with debtor in possession, DIP. The debtor in possession financing should kick in quickly, where a company, a specialist, comes in and says, we'll buy that cargo, but we'll buy it at a 30% discount, and we'll make sure it's all delivered. That's the lubrication in the system, the DIP, debt, debtor in possession financing. Okay, that should have kicked in, and it did not. This is standard bankruptcy procedure, Elijah, and it did not kick in. And my team, this is a lot of this is Euroraj. Euroraj came right out and said, I think they're rejecting the Treasury bill as a form of payment. And that is the problem. That's holding things up. That's the wrench in the works. That's why the cargo is not being delivered. That's why the debtor in financing is not working. Because the debtor in financing is, is demanding non-dollars and the port owners through their you know, retail chain like Sears or Staples or Target or whatever, uh, they're offering dollars and the Asians are refusing the dollars. So it's happening on the table of the debtor in, in possession, DIP financing. But the problem is not the bankruptcy of Han Jin. The problem is they're rejecting the Treasury bill. I think we're starting to see the, the rejections now on a widespread basis. And you, you've seen in, in some YouTubes, uh, William Mount uh, offered this, a Tacoma, Washington port, a, a South Korean vessel entered. Hours later, it left without unloading its cargo. I think they're rejecting the Treasury bill. Okay, now, apart from all the port problems, I've been saying now for about three years, and this is directly through um, advice and, and, and statements made by The Voice. He told me back in 2013 or so, you're going to start seeing movements toward developing a gold trade note which would be a short-term type of instrument, and it'll be gold-backed, and it will be used in trade payment. And he said, it'll take time to unfold, but you wait. Once we get some difficulties with uh, trade payments, and once you get more problems with the dollar, and once you get a couple more years of this insane QE bond monetization purchase program, which is nothing more than African Zimbabwe hyper-monetary inflation that we call good. It's not good. It's destructive. Okay, so the voice tipped me off three years ago, and now it looks like China is on the verge of announcing a gold-backed RMB short-term note, in other words, a bond of a short maturity. It, it, all it needs to be is, is like three months, six months, 12 months as a vehicle, as a financial security, secured by gold, not the, the good word and trust of the U.S. government, because there isn't any left. It will be backed by gold. Countries that want to engage in trade will have to buy the short-term notes called the gold trade notes, RMB currency, gold-backed, it's all starting, I think, to happen very soon. It's going to get a lot of publicity because it will be seen as the solution or a very important, credible, workable solution for trade payments resolving the problems at ports. It doesn't matter that Han Jin went bankrupt. What matters is the DIP financing is not working. And I think that's because the DIP financing agent wants a gold trade note. And that is not going to be in the U.S. press. I'm a, a tremendous advocate against the U.S. press. I think when it comes to anything regarding finance and economics, the chances are over 80% what you're being told is a grand lie. And I've got, I got a number of years, like 10 or 12 years of experience and hundreds of examples to back up my statement. So if people are new to this and they're not familiar with a lot of Internet sources 
of for financial press, financial and economic reporting data. Uh, you, you need to start understanding a, a very unsettling point that the mainstream news does not give adequate, impartial, complete news about finance and economics. They start with an assumption that the dollar is good, that QE bond monetization is good, that the stock market is legitimately up, that the economy is in a sluggish growth mode, and they're all lies. That's, that's my belief, Elijah. That's what I think is happening. The gold trade RMB short-term note will be equivalent to the gold trade note, and it's, it's close. We're very close. Definitely. And mentioning about the media, that's, you know, one of the reasons, um, you know, what we do what we do right here and, you know, on financeliberty.com. I mean, that's why one of the reasons I started is because it's just the mainstream media does not tell you a lot of the things I think people should know about. Moving on here, besides the yuan uh, becoming gold backed, as you see in the future, did you want to discuss some of the ways you see that the IMF is going to back the SDR with gold? Okay, this is a, a super duper attempted solution that could happen very soon by the Western banker elite. They call themselves, well, we don't, they don't call, we call them the banker cabal. Uh, cabal is a word used for very evil and very criminal, uh, kind of like a crime syndicate, but at a higher level of crime, crimes against humanity, theft against humanity, printing themselves trillion dollar loans that never get paid back. I'd like a billion dollar loan that's never paid back. Do you mind, Elijah? I just want one billion, okay? It doesn't have to be a trillion. One billion jackass loan, 0.2%, and I never have to pay it back. Roll it over every time. That's what I would like. Well, that's what these banker cabal members do. Trillion dollar loans. And you think I'm making this up? The Ron Paul inspired 2009 independent audit of the Federal Reserve revealed two batches of loans totaling $23 trillion lent at 0.5% to the owners of the Federal Reserve. I think that was to buy up their favorite assets in the world after they crashed the system. Okay, so here's what I think. This is, this is complex. I'll try to you know, get the, the major pieces to it uh, described as best I can. I believe the, the, when the, the Chinese RMB currency, the yuan, the RMB currency, RMB just stands for renminbi. And I, I had a Chinese fellow correct me and said, Jim, you need to understand something. Yuan has a symbol in Chinese that's the same as the dollar. So the yuan is really the Chinese dollar. Okay, Chinese currency. Uh, if you go to Nicaragua, you'll see for the Cordoba uh, a C with a dollar sign after it. Okay, it's Cordoba dollar. It's the Cordoba currency. Okay, it, it gets it gets very weird. But he said the the RMB just means money. Okay, money in the yuan denomination. That's how you think of it. Okay, so we have an event. It's supposedly today. We'll see how it turns out that the RMB is going to be included in the IMF, International Monetary Fund's basket of currencies called the special drawing rights. That includes the dollar, the euro, the British pound, and the Japanese yen. Now there's a fifth, the Chinese yuan. Okay, fine. The dollar percentage weight does not change. It's under 1%. The euro loses... I think 8%. The British pound only had 8, but it's going to lose 3. And that'll give the 8 plus 3, 11% to the Chinese RMB. Okay, so big questions come up. Whether there's going to be a new SDR basket bond that countries around the world can use for their banking systems. Well, if they do that, they're going to be selling off treasury bonds of the U.S. dollar denomination 
and buying SDR bonds of the basket, IMF basket denomination. Well, if they do that, there can be a lot of sales. I mean, like hundreds of billions of dollars of U.S. Treasuries dumped. So I don't know how this is going to play out. Now, here's the super duper uh, Western banker cabal potential solution. They might come out and say, we're going to do a gold backed SDR bond and we're going to back with gold those four now five currencies, back them with gold and it'll be backed with Basel Switzerland gold which is the Bank for International Settlements. I don't like this, and I don't think any Eastern, Asian, or emerging market nation country will like this, because what it stinks like, what it smells like, what it indicates is more of a unipolar world where the banker cabal controls all the gold in Basel, Switzerland, and they say to small countries like, say, Bolivia and others, you want to participate with the gold trade notes, then you need to send us 800 tons of gold from Bolivia and secure it in any way, shape, or form you can, like with a resource swap. Bolivia has lots of aluminum, tin, silver, iron, copper, lots and lots of metal. They don't have a tremendous amount of gold production, so they might swap their other metals for future production, for our current supply of gold that might therefore in this new system that I des describe as very unsavory and very undesirable in a unipolar sense, Bolivia would be forced to contribute gold to Basel, which would amplify its gold reserves for the benefit of the world. We've seen the benefit of the world in the last several years of QE, of, of wars, of sanctions, and all kinds of destructive measures that have not resulted in any recovery of the economy, global economy, and any recovery in the United States economy, any recovery in the European economy, any recovery in the UK economy, and now we're seeing problems in Germany and China, the two powerhouses. So I don't like their solution. I don't like the provisions that I think would follow on, like Bolivia having to donate or put forth their gold to Basel. Would they ever see it back? All you have to look, is, look for precedent is at the New York Fed, where the Dutch, the Austrians, and the Germans never received their gold back, so they steal it. Okay, this is a prescription for unipolar continuation of power, while at the same time stealing more gold. I don't like anything about a gold-backed IMF SDR bond. I don't like anything about it. And I think Russia and China will say, F you. We don't want to have anything to do with this. Because Russia and China have made it very clear they want a multipolar world. They want gold centers in Dubai. They want it in Hong Kong, Australia, Frankfurt, Germany, London other nations in the world. They want centers all across the world with gold centers, gold trading centers, gold markets, gold vaults, a multipolar world. The United States regards any multipolar solution as an act of terrorism against the dollar. The U.S. is being exposed now, uh, Elijah, uh, in many, many ways as being sp a sponsor of terrorism. And the more the United States accuses other countries of being terrorist related, the more it's being exposed itself in Washington. And this is very, very ugly, dangerous stuff. All right. And the last main question that I was going to ask you about uh, your, your current forecast is uh, the Saudi oil sales. Did you want to talk about this? Yes, we're, we're having some very nasty, weird, and, and devious dealings with the Saudis, the U.S. and the Saudis. This is like a climax of corruption uh, as a preface. All the UBS and Credit Suisse claimed violations 
uh, of, of legitimate law. That was back in 2013 and 14. Okay, Th those were a ruse. Okay, since when does the U.S. government have jurisdiction over the Swiss banking system? They claimed that there were American clients. Okay, and that was their leverage. But it's far deeper than that, what I've come to learn. And the voice was all over this from the start. What I've come to learn is the U.S. government wanted to find in violation the Swiss banking giants. There, there are two of them. That's UBS and Credit Suisse. And once in violation, the fines were big, the penalties. But that wasn't the main motive. The U.S. and London boys, the bankers, wanted to gain control of a subsidiary of those two banks, their bullion bank business, so they could steal Arab gold. They stole a lot of Saudi gold. The Saudis have had the most. And the Saudis reacted not by going public because they were threatened to be murdered. They reacted by taking their remaining gold in Saudi and moving it to France and later moving it to Deutsche Bank vaults. Okay. <sighs> That's a little bit of Saudi history. Here's some more Saudi history. Notice in the Treasury International Capital, the TIC reports, TIC, for years and years, I mean like over 20 years, the Saudi U.S. Treasury bond holdings were never delineated as an a line item. They were always called OPEC holdings. Okay, well that's all very cute. Kind of like the Caribbean holdings. Covers Cayman and Caribbean and I'm um, Cayman and uh, Bermuda and Bahama, which were basically Bank of England outposts. So that's how they hid the Bank of England activity. But they hid the Saudi activity by calling it OPEC. Okay. Now, you had 40-some years of tremendous profits by the Saudis and the required recycling into treasury bonds. It was part of the Kissinger Petro Recycling Plan and Agreement that the Saudis signed on to as part of the dollar being the standard for all oil payments. And the Saudis accumulated three or five, three to five trillion dollars worth of treasury bonds. They don't have access to them because it serves as the core holdings for the U.S. government Department of Treasury Exchange Stabilization Fund, which they use to rig financial markets around the world. The Saudis have been told you cannot have your money back that it's too valuable and critical for holding the Western financial system together. So the Saudis were basically told by the U.S., we're stealing your three or four or five trillion dollars. Now the Saudis are trying to sell because they're desperate for cash. They're, okay, the U.S. press likes to say the Saudis are desperate for cash because they're engaged in a Yemen war, a costly Yemen war. Well, that's partly true, but gee, why don't they have access to their three trillion in treasury bonds? Because we stole it. Why don't they have access to their perhaps, oh, I, I think maybe about a half a trillion dollars worth of gold bullion in Switzerland? Because we stole it. Okay, we signed up the Saudis to be the partners to execute the de facto petrodollar standard where the backing for the dollar since 1973 with the embargo has been crude oil. Not, not in a, an exchangeable sense, but in a de facto practical sense. Okay, that's all been turned upside down by stealing the Saudi gold in Switzerland and the bullion banks and telling them they cannot have their three trillion or more in treasure bonds at the Exchange Stabilization Fund, and I guarantee you not 1% of Americans know what the Department of Treasury's Exchange Stabilization Fund is, even after I just described it. So the Saudis are angry, they're feeling betrayed, 
and the phrase you often hear is they're being thrown under the bus. Okay? I think they're, they're now motivated heavily for selling a 10% interest in Aramco. That's the Arab American petro giant. Not just oil production, but petroleum, uh, what do you call it? petrochemicals. And, and a lot of engineering facilities and a lot of foreigners working as, as consultants like the Norwegians and, and others. You can go to the oildrum.com and see a lot of their work. And it's, it's really quite advanced and impressive. But the Saudis have been lying about their oil reserves. They're largely depre depleted, and that's their motive for the Yemen war. They want to steal Yemen's oil and gas with the U.S. government and military assistance. Okay. You're getting the picture that the rogue state is the Americans and the British. Um, I believe that the sale of the Aramco share, 10% share, which, by the way, is calling for $1.1 trillion. So they're valuing Aramco at $11 trillion. It'll be the largest open company in the world, you know, as opposed to a crime center like a bank. Um, I think we're going to see, Elijah, the Chinese buying into Aramco to guarantee their oil sales and oil supply. And the next step, maybe like three days later, will be the Saudis saying, we hereby accept RMB currency for oil sales, not just from China, like Vietnam or uh, Indonesia, well, probably not Indonesia, but uh, Malaysia, uh, maybe Korea could pay in RMB. And, and what it's going to do is going to start a stampede out of treasury bills held in the banking systems for the countries that want to import oil from Saudi Arabia, which is still a very big oil producer. They're number two in the world. They're not number one anymore. The Russians are. They're number two. So this could be the vengeance of the Saudis, which has a further impetus in this new law from the U.S. Congress that allows victims from 9-11 to sue the Saudis for restitution and, and awards that Obama vetoed and both the Senate and the House overrode for the veto. So it is now law, and, and this is really kind of strange. I mean, it could not be stranger. You, you got the Congress saying that victims of the 9-11 kills, there are about 3,000 of them, can sue the Saudi Arabians and, and maybe actually draw on money <laughs> that's sitting in the Exchange Stabilization Fund maintained and managed by the U.S. Treasury Department. This is very, very convoluted and weird stuff. But I don't believe the Saudis had much of a role except for Bandar Bush hiring those young kids who were painted as patsies because it was really done by Langley, MI6, and especially the Mossad, but in Langley, it was the Bush crime family. Okay, so this was an inside job, blamed on the Saudis, and now they got a law that allows the victims to draw on Saudi funds. And the Saudis are going to say, wait a minute, we cry foul. We're done with you guys in the United States. You stole our gold. You sequestered and isolated our treasury bonds. Now you're opening up our, our assets for, for restitution and lawsuits. We're done with you guys. We're going to sign on with the, the Chinese and Russians, and they've already got a deal between Saudi and Russia to try to limit, to some extent, oil output in order to bring about a recovery in the oil price. So the Saudis are working with Russia on the oil price and market and industry. The Saudis are working with the Chinese as investors for numerous industries inside Saudi land, and I think the Saudis are going to be selling a giant piece uh, of Aramco to the Chinese and immediately, Elijah, immediately announce they accept RMB payments for oil sales, and that is the death of the petrodollar right there. We, we had steps now, six or eight steps toward the death of the petrodollar, and I have outlined many of them. 
like the dismantling and liquidation of petrodollar derivative contracts. I don't want to get into all that over again. But uh, I think we're about to see final coffin nail for the petrodollar. And this, this legislation against Saudi is the agent for that action. Now, that was one of the forecasts that we were going to cover next. You made that in 2014 that the Saudis would accept the yuan, the RMB, currency from China. We haven't seen that yet, you say, but we've seen some OPEC nations like Nigeria and Algeria do this. Yes, we have two nations within OPEC. They're not Persian Gulf Arab nations, but Nigeria and Algeria. There's two, Nigeria in West Africa, Algeria in North Africa, which is an Arab nation. Those two nations already, this has happened in, in just the last several months, Nigeria and Algeria accept Chinese currency in oil sales. They're the first two within OPEC to do so. It's all going to get wide open when the Chinese accept China. I'm sorry, when the Saudis accept Chinese RMB. It's going to be wide open when the Saudis accept Chinese RMB for oil sales. And it, it's coming. It, it's coming. You can you can just smell it. If you have a good nose, that is. If you have a nose that's directed toward the mind control mainstream media, I don't think you can see foresee anything. I think it, it stupefies people. I mean, I used to watch mainstream news when I was young. I I've got my suspicions, Elijah when I was in high school because I didn't believe all the reporting on the Vietnam War. I started talking to friends of mine who had older brothers who came back from the war. I started reading other things, not so much on the internet, but other like other journals that talked about tremendous uh, weapons sales and profits for the military industrial complex and kickbacks, kickbacks to senators. Then I started reading about a real big item uh, Air America going after the Cambodian Triangle to capture the heroin trade of Laos, Cambodia. And that now is open public information. So my distrust of the, the mainstream press started a long time ago when my neck was on the line for potentially going to Vietnam and entering the meat grinder. You know, I, I had a student deferment. You know, okay, I... I'm not proud of the fact that because I was a student, I was a student, I avoided the war. But uh, I, I am proud of the fact that for my sophomore year in 1971, I dropped my 1S deferment. And I said, you know, go ahead. Pennsylvania uh, may not get to my number, which was 218. And they didn't. They got up to 160, and that meant that I could never be drafted. So I, that's how I avoided the military service for Vietnam, and the Vietnam War ended when I was uh, 20 years old. So, you know, very ugly time, but, you know, mainstream media now has a mission of protecting the syndicate, protecting the dollar, making the right statements about the war and the sanctions. Well, which war? Because we've got lots of war. Well, war is good. You know, war is not good. They have a message that war is good for the economy. It's not. It's very destructive. They have a message that there's a trickle-down positive effect. No, they don't. You have a trickle-down negative effect, and the positive side doesn't have seven steps. It only has two. Okay, almost all the mainstream messages, Elijah, are, are, are very contrary to reality. Uh, it goes so far as the U.S. military has a contract. They pay $5 million to the National Football League to have an honor guard at almost every game and every single playoff game. So we're getting war mixed in and woven together with sports. In most of the college bowl games, you have a U.S. military honor guard. It's the same thing. They pay the NCAA. I don't like these trends. It's, 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 the message is that the fascist element is pro-war and the people should regard it as soldier sacrifice. But it's, it's far more complicated than that. 
Anyway, enough of, enough of the mainstream news, Elijah. I, I could go on for a long, long time. All right. Now, moving on here, another forecast that we were going to cover you made in 2012. You said the U.S. government was going to confiscate pension plans. And you say that we've seen this with worker pensions and lately with the money market funds. Uh, yes, we have. Um, if you want to research this and get a better feel of how it's affecting the money market funds, all you have to do is check out Vanguard and Fidelity. Now, those are two giant mutual fund houses. They've got recent statements. They're, they're more like you know, declaration of, of law by the fascist state. Uh, they've got statements that they've made to Vanguard and Fidelity investors that your money market account will have limitations now and must be directed toward a special U.S. government treasury bond. Okay, we're starting to see the appearance of the special U.S. government treasury bond. Two years ago, right around now, two years ago, it was summer of 15, no, summer of 14, 2014, Obama announced that federal government employee pension funds would participate in what's called a special U.S. Treasury bond issued. I don't have the full name. I, 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 there is a name for it, and I don't remember it. I don't get exposed to it often. I just call it the special U.S. government treasury bond. So you have Vanguard and Fidelity directing money, all the, the, the loose cash from the money markets, who, which have been turned absolutely upside down in the last two years, three years. They do not respond well to the, the near zero interest rate offered to short-term treasuries. They don't respond well to what you see in CDs for six months where they give you, you know, half a percent. That's nothing. The money market has been turned upside down. And, and recently they've got their solution by directing it all into the special U.S. government treasury bond, which, again, doesn't pay anything. All the while, the U.S. government employee pensions are all being pushed into the special U.S. government treasury bond. Okay, the trend looks clear to me that pensions and money markets are going to be like a cattle herd moved into treasury bonds. Because when, here's why. The U.S. government cannot finance its trillion dollar annual deficit. This is not small. I believe it was 1.3 trillion in the last year. Fiscal year 15 just ended. One point, they, 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 they're so nervy. They're, 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 they're not just liars. They're bold liars right to your face. They say the deficit for fiscal 2015 was only 600 billion. But if you do some simple math that a third grader could do, you take the total debt at the end of fiscal 2014 and you look at the change to the end of the fiscal year 2015 and you notice that it's 1.3 trillion more. Then how can you say it's only 600 billion for the last year's deficit. And they, they come up with an even bolder stupid lie by saying, well, we use seasonality. We do adjustments for seasonality. There is no adjustment for seasonality over a full year. That's a full cycle. Okay, this is so sickening, Elijah. But what appears to be the new trend is that the money markets through the giant mutual funds are going into special treasury bonds. What's coming next, I believe, this is the forecast, what I think is coming next is, and this, this is really not fully stated in, in the message I, I wrote to you in our notes, it's not just pensions, not just money markets, it's 401ks and IRAs, the company sponsored and the personal personally managed pension funds, I think they are going to be steered 
into the special treasury bonds. And that will cover a rather significant slice of the trillion dollar deficit. But here's why they need to do something soon. I believe we're about to see the launch uh, of a separate domestic only U.S. dollar. By that I mean a new dollar that will only be used and recognized for payments inside the U.S. borders. And it's given a name. It's called the Treasury Dollar. It's given other name, but just think of it as a Treasury Dollar as opposed to the Federal Reserve Dollar. The Treasury Dollar is like a declaration of independence, but at the same time, they must manage a trillion dollar annual federal government deficit, and I believe they're going to do so on the back of money markets and private pension funds. Later, they might go after the corporate pension fund, the managed, you know, defined benefit, defined contribution pension funds. I don't know. Very difficult. But I do believe that if they go after just the 401ks and the IRAs and the Keo, Keo is much smaller, right? Keo, Keo used to be kind of significant 20 years ago, like for private dentists and things like that. Uh, my uncle had a Keo. Uh, he was a dentist in Iowa. He's gone. <clears throat> he died. But I believe a significant slice of the trillion dollars for the annual U.S. government deficit can be covered with money market, 401k, and IRA. And, and they're going to say it's to enable the survival of the country. And you cannot get it. You cannot block it. You can't do anything. So if you've got a, a wonderful $200,000 IRA or 401k and you think, oh, this is doing well, the stock market's up and my investments are good, it might all get transferred into a special treasury bond that earns jack shit and will be backed by a bankrupt U.S. government. I think the U.S. government has already defaulted on its debt. This is a whole new topic, Elijah. It, it's not just the Federal Reserve that went into bankruptcy over a year ago, March of 2015. It's the U.S. government entered bankruptcy. And the major creditors, I believe, led by China, decided we don't want any announcement of the bankruptcy because we want the Treasury bond to continue trading with QE support by the Federal Reserve. In other words, we need a long time to get rid of ours before they lose almost all their value as in most bankruptcies and defaults. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so that's, that's about the pension and money markets. Now, while we're on the topic, you know, you're discussing treasury bonds. In 2015, another forecast you made was that treasury bonds, the 10-year treasury bond yield would decline to 1.5% and then later to 1%. Now, you say that we've seen the decline to 1.5%, but we're still waiting on the decline all the way to 1%. Did you want to discuss a little bit about what's played out? Yeah. When I made that forecast, we were dealing with 2%, 2.3% 10-year uh, treasury yields. It, they, they have a name for that. It's called the TNX, like the 10 index. Uh, the TNX for the 10-year yield, um, we were bouncing around. 2.0, 2.3%. And at the time, you know, I had plenty of people say, Jim, that's another stupid forecast that you made. I said, give it time. Give it a year or two. Let the U.S. Treasury black hole build. Let everything get wrecked in the housing market again. Let, let other elements of the bond market, like, for instance, now the car market asset-backed bonds, uh, let them get wrecked. Let the student loan bonds get wrecked. Let everything get wrecked and you'll see a march into treasury bonds as the only viable bond instrument out there that's doing well. And, and we've seen that. Um, we've seen that. I don't really know that the forecast of down to 1.0% is going to happen. We had a bounce off the 1.5. I think I don't have the exact number in front of me, but I think we're around 1.65 or 1.70 right now on the on the TNX. Uh, 
if we get more disastrous economic news, it's becoming quite clear, Elijah, that the U.S. economy is in a very powerful recession that's been over seven years in duration. Very clear. Now we're starting to get mentioned by numerous central banks, not just the U.S. Fed, not just the Euro Central Bank, but the Bank of England. They're starting to all say it looks like we can never get away from QE, namely covering the government deficits African style by monetizing them with printed money. And they're also starting to say we can never really get away from the zero percent. They're starting to admit that their monetary policy is a failure on the economic front. They always call it a stimulus. Well, sure, it's stimulus for a criminal Wall Street bank. It's wonderful. They got all kinds of worthless bonds. They can sell them to the Fed with printed money. And hey, everybody's happy making money. Let's go to the Hamptons and spend a couple weeks during the summer. And, and, and get another boat, maybe, because one, one or two boats might not be enough. And have some really expensive parties. Anyway, um, we might see wider recognition of the U.S. economic recession. It's vicious. It's absolutely fierce. And Obamacare has really been an important piece for wrecking small business. I want to get into a lot of aspects of Obamacare, but uh, it's been disastrous, not just as a plan in and of itself, but the effect on small business and their hiring. They're not. We might, with a wider recognition of the recession, especially if Wall Street engineers a stock market decline, we might see the 1% target hit for the TNX, that 10-year Treasury bond yield. Uh, I, I'm of the opinion that Wall Street sees a real big profit opportunity right now in poking a hole in the stock market bubble. All they have to do is start making some negative comments and have the Fed make some negative comments, and the Wall Street boys will load on lots and lots of S&P short f futures, and here's the real big item. Not a big market, not a huge market in it, but it's the options on S&P futures. S&P futures have like 20 or 30 to 1 leverage. An option has a multiple of that. So they're like 100 to 200 in leverage. Should be illegal, but they're not. So Wall Street comes out and punctures their own sponsored asset bubble in the stock market, but they profit for it from the decline and make a lot of money. And then they say, well, naturally, we had our portfolio insurance in place. Okay, well, that sounds all very nice, except you watch their words and watch their economic outlooks and, and all the different comments that come from the Fed, the central bank, and they're all going to be saying the same thing. The economy is in real big trouble. The only thing that looks really good right now is treasury bonds. <laughs> Who are the biggest holders of treasury bonds? The Fed and the Wall Street Bank. That's how you possibly get down to 1.0%, Elijah. Uh, and, and it's really a not, not a long distance away from where we are now. If you take the 1.7 or 1.75, that's a, a 25 basis point move from one and a half. And I, I think it got down to something like 1.35 or 1.4 percent. So we're about 30 or 40 basis points away from the recent bottom in the 10-year yield, that TNX I described. So if we have a, a swing down, usually you swing down by the same amount you swung up. That could be a swing down to the 1.0, which will have a huge psychological barrier and effect. The, the whole world will say, wait a minute, something's wrong. 1.0 percent, and, and we had intraday a 0.96. Okay, that's going to be an alarm that the whole system is broken. All right. Well, Jim Willie, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we let you go, are there any last thoughts you'd like to add, and where can our viewers find you online? Oh, last thoughts? Uh, I'll be really brief. I think, I think this October we're going to have multiple surprises. I think it's going to be a very dangerous time 
I think we, we might start off by seeing the IMF in, in, include the, the RMB, Chinese currency. We might get some follow-on effects from that, a lot of talk. Uh, some countries say we're going to shift our bonds away from treasuries, uh, away from euro bonds, away from UK gilts, and into Chinese bonds. But watch out for a bigger gold solution coming out of the IMF because it's going to be a unipolar banker cabal. But there, there are a lot of other surprises that, that could come. I think what we're going to see is one big announcement, a few days later, another big surprise announcement, another week later, another big surprise, huge effect announcement. And when October's over, we might, we might see quite a few big events, all of which would be very disruptive. And not one event of that type and magnitude we have seen in the last several months. So October and November might be very big. We were told that there'd be some things that happened in September, but, you know, when the U.S. government threatens to nuke a foreign country and kill its leaders, that country tends to change its plans on going against the dollar. Like kicking, I call it kicking out the legs of the king dollar throne. So China had last March a plan for a gold-backed RMB currency, and the U.S. threatened them with nuclear war. This is how we're defending the dollar. I told people back in 2005, in the late stages of the king dollar, it's going to be defended with war. And my father told me it was one of the stupidest things I've ever heard, he told me. And I said, well, now we're seeing it. You, you can't prove to the mainstream news advocates my father still does not agree that we're using war to defend the dollar. He thinks we're using war to defend against Syrian aggression, Syrian chemical weapons, Syrian sponsorship of ISIS. I said, no, Syria is not sponsoring Irish, I ISIS. Langley and Mossad are, and there's lots of proof of it. Oh, yeah, but your proof is on the Internet. You can't discuss these things with people who have perception that is distorted. And, and here's the phrase that I, I just learned yesterday. It's, it's a brilliant phrase from one of my colleagues who has experience in courtrooms defending patents and, and other things. You can't discuss some of these things with people who follow mainstream news because they don't accept what you regard as evidence as fact, as data, because they say it's not properly entered as evidence. What they're saying is, oh, all that stuff you read on the Internet, it's all rubbish. Oh, really? Well, I read National Football League scores on the Internet. I read my account balance from my bank in Pennsylvania online, and that's accurate. I read lots of different analyses of... Uh, bankruptcies for banks and criminal proceedings against banks for bond fraud, and that seems to be adequate and appears later in the New York Times. But anything that goes against the dollar on the Internet is not properly entered into evidence. Oh, my God. You can't argue with these people. Anyway, okay, it's been exactly, Elijah, exactly 12 and a half years now for the Hattrick letter. 150 monthly reports. My gosh, you should see my file manager and all the reports going back year after year. It's, it's like a full page, <laughs> four columns per page uh, of, of documents because it's, it's three of them per month. One is a, a grand draft and two of them are the actual published documents for the, the two monthly reports. One is called the Global Money War Report, and the other one is called the Gold and Currency Report. The, the Money War Report is about higher level issues, uh, de-dollarization by, by Asia, like the super, superpowers of Russia and China, uh, movements away from the dollar with other platforms like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, movements like, like uh, you know, the trade unions that the U.S. is trying to foment, the higher level thing. That's the Global Money War Report. And the other one is the gold and currency report where I talk you know, a good deal about the dollar and movements away from the dollar, challenges of the dollar at the ground level by other foreign central banks, 
Uh, movements of gold and silver, demand of gold and silver, shortages of gold and silver, actions within the, the corrupt COMEX market, and a lot of other things. So there, there are two reports each month, and I, I love mentioning this as a final point. There are two compliments that I love to get, and I get them every single week now because people are listening to the, the, the interviews on, on the podcast like this, and they say to me, Jim, I'm one of those people. And the two compliments go like this. I've been listening to your podcast and reading your public articles for the last two or three or four years. And finally, I decided to sign up for your newsletter. And I wish I had done so sooner because it is such interesting work and intriguing. Reads like a spy novel. You do a lot of work. You tie things together expertly. Thank you for your work. I'm one of those people. The other compliment I get is a little weirder. Uh, I was a client of yours several years ago. I, I remained on for two or three years, but I, I decided back in 2012 to, to exit, cancel my subscription, and I've been back now for a year, and I don't know why I ever left, because this is the best newsletter I've seen. I tried a few others, and they all seem kind of vacant. They missed a lot of things that you never miss. So. I invite people to go to the website, goldenjackass.com, and uh, bounce around a little bit, read up. I don't know how familiar you are with a lot of these concepts, how uh, expert you are, how, uh, what's the word, familiar you are with financial economic concepts. But, you know, after you bounce around a little bit, whether you're new or older at this, newer or, or more experienced at this, sign up for the hat trick letter, and I... Don't think you'll regret it. It's uh, It reads like a magazine, and I've got named chapters. So some people write me and say, you get six chapters, but I only read four, but they were all fascinating. And maybe I'll get to the other two chapters, but it doesn't matter. That's okay. I already know the economy's in tatters. I don't need to read your your chapter on the economy. I just leafed through it and looked at a couple graphs. Okay, that, that's what that's what my clients do. And there, there are a lot of them, and they... Believe it or not, they come from 76 countries, um, and some are small, you know, like Malta. <laughs> I got a couple from Malta. Uh, it's funny, but uh, I invite people to go to the website, look around, and sign up for the hat trick letter. And I, I thank you for having me on again, Elijah. It's always fun. It's I get all worked up, and I, I. I I don't. I don't really apologize for getting worked up about this. We're we're talking about the death of the dollar and the end of the American empire and regime that has a nasty new name now. It's called the empire of chaos because we're trying to defend the dollar by spreading terrorism and chaos with our tools like ISIS. It's it's very very ugly what's going on. Um, um, I'm, I just want to see – I'm a U.S. citizen. I'm, I'm a loyal U.S. citizen. I don't like what happened to our country after 9-11. I believe that was a fascist dictatorship coup d'etat with an inside job. So I want to see the republic restored. You talk about finance and liberty. Well, restoring the public is very consistent with the goals and, and ideals of your website. So thanks for having me on. Definitely. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, bye now. This video was brought to you in part by ReluctantPreppers.com. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. Click here to subscribe for free to ReluctantPreppers.com.